go back to 1986, I think, 1986. So we have, Vietnam had 335 hectares of industrial land. In the to total in the country, 335 hectares, absolutely nothing. Fast forward to today, we have 80,000 hectares of industrial land in the country. This is a phenomenal growth of, of, uh, of, of land be coming in onto the market. You'll see there the sort of the overall GDP growth and the growth of FDI, which is you know, important in terms of what we're seeing um, in this sector. So the key facts, Vietnam, sort of a snapshot on the key facts, 80,000 hectares of land and f nearly 6 million square meters of ready-built factories. So in the north, we have about 19,000 hectares and 2.7 million square meters of ready-built factories. Some of the key developers in the north, uh, VSIP, I know VSIP are here in the room. They, have, they enjoy about 13% of market share uh, in the north, then Kimback and Viglacera and, and a number of others. The, the key findings that we've seen in, in the north in terms of the occupiers it's a little bit it came to the market or is a little bit after the south so we've seen more high tech we've seen more electronics we see uh, machinery equipment so there's, there's different nuances between the north and the south and the central areas as I mentioned what we've tried to do is plot every industrial park in the country which is not that easy. Uh, so all the existing industrial parks and all the future supply of industrial parks as well. And then try and tie that in with the infrastructure. You'll see within the, in the report the existing infrastructure and then the new supply of infrastructure. These are all very key components of how the industrial market works. And then deep sea ports and then the air, air freight, cargo, etc., etc. So in terms of where Vietnam is today and how it's going to grow in the future. You can see a lot of new supply new, of uh, industrial parks um, in the future, and Haiphong in particular getting a lot of interest at the moment. Central Vietnam, very much the latecomer to the party. The south was first, then the north, and then, and then central Vietnam. Still very, quite immature market. The positive part about Central Vietnam is that the infrastructure is good and also you have a very forward-thinking, progressive uh, local authorities in, in Da Nang which are making ease of bid doing business much, much, um, much, much better. So there are positive parts to the central part, so Da Nang in particular, however, limited uh, number of you know, human resources, so the talent pool is fairly limited. And that's why we're seeing a fairly slow but steady um, growth rate in, in the central location. 16% of the occupied in food processing, interesting enough, and fabricated metal projects. And then moving on to the south, some of the key developers will see Beckmex, uh, as we know, uh, etc., and Tan Tuan. So what we got, so in the South, Manish, uh, this was the, the, the traditional sort of um, um, sector. So the South where we started first in terms of the industrial sector, machinery and equipment, textiles and apparel, uh, rubber and plastic. So the more traditional sort of industrial uh, sectors that, uh, that operate in the South. And then you can see pretty, pretty, diverse uh, range of um, industrial parks and a lot of new supply again coming through around the Ho Chi Minh, Binh Nhung, Dong Nai, Long An um, and out to Vung Tau. So quite a, a, a uh, thriving um, industrial market in the south. So the advantage is why is Vietnam um, considered and what we think is the going to be the manufacturing hub for Southeast Asia. There's a number of key advantages, what we think stand out. They are, so the incentives, so economic zones, very important for, for um, businesses operating in this sector. So economic zones, 
um, being established, which obviously have bring with it a number of advantages like tax exemption, visa exemption, uh, land use levy um, exemption. So this is one of the key drivers. So the government's really trying to promote um, businesses moving into Vietnam to take advantage of these incentives. Movement from China, very much happening at the moment. We're getting a lot of inquiries from businesses that want to move out of China. China's gradually moving up the value chain. They no longer want to be dealing in low cost manufacturing. So we're seeing this shift of movement from multinational companies that are operating in China, but also Chinese companies that are looking to uh, move away from China. These trade wars, as I say, are going to uh, accelerate that process. Then we have the cost of uh, costs are rising in China and still Vietnam looking fairly favorable in terms of labor costs and land prices still fairly favorable as well. A couple of case studies there. Nike and Adidas, you'll see there the shift of what has happened over the last few years in terms of where these products are being made and that shift from China to Vietnam. We see a big uh, change of, of um, countries that you'll see there from Adidas in 2012. We saw that crossover and now a large percentage of their products being made in Vietnam. Free trade agreements over the, over the past few years, a lot of trade agreements being signed off. Uh, we've counted, so there's 16 free trade agreements that have either been signed off or are still in negotiations. Uh, key ones being, I mean, Korea uh, in particular, which is why we see significant investment by Samsung as, a, as an example, um, but also EU trade agreement in the process being um, signed off. And then the CPTPP, which should be ratified by the end of the year. So all these are helping businesses in terms of that movement of goods. Vietnam's still considered a very strategic location. Uh, for the North in particular, that movement from China, that location and that proximity to China is very, very important. Uh, which makes a lot of sense, but also because of the coastline, because of deep sea ports, we are on uh, the, the um, very strategically located in terms of uh, the shipping lanes and 40% of all goods that come through the East Sea uh, obviously pass by uh, Vietnam. So Cat Lai and uh, Haiphong in particular, getting a lot of that, that interest. So the movement of goods, if you speak to any of the manufacturers, it's all about the lead-in time. So why people are considering Vietnam over China is because they can cut their lead-in time, so that when the product leaves the factory to when it actually gets to the end destination, as opposed to China, they can cut that by seven to 10 days. So it's a big strategic plus point of being, leave, uh, being located in Vietnam. The other advantages are, as everyone knows, growth of middle income um, and affluent income classes are, is growing considerably. Vietnam's middle income population, they're growing by 19% on a, uh, an annual basis comparing very, very favorably to most of the other Southeast Asian countries. And then the interesting one for us is number of students now uh, studying abroad has risen significantly over the last few years. So we now have nearly 60,000 students studying overseas on an annual basis. The key point in terms of e uh, e-commerce, this is going to play a very, very significant part in terms of the growth of the industrial and logistics sector. So e-commerce now being a very, very active part of uh, the day-to-day -day life of a lot of, a lot of people. So I'm sure you've ordered lots of your goods on your phone recently. Um, 
according to our statistics or our numbers, uh, penetration now, I think, so percentage of people using smartphones, 70, uh, sorry, 70%, 30% of smartphones, 70% uh, non-smartphone, but the internet uses and the shopping behaviors now, 33% of um, people now using um, the e-commerce platform as a way to, to um, buy your goods online. So what this will do is with creating a lot of demand for the logistics, all these, all these products, all these goods that you're ordering on your phone have to be delivered. They're coming from a distri distribution warehouse and then they have to come um, you know, through, through a network of, of uh, maybe smaller uh, warehouses in and around the city. So this is gonna have quite a big impact in terms of the demand for logistics and warehousing, which I think Greg is gonna to touch on uh, further. Where we are in Vietnam, still very, very early days. You can see we're right at the sort of the immature, sort of emerging, evolving stage of the logistics market. And we're still some way behind India, Indonesia as an example. But you can see what we need to do to get to the next stage. So some of those points in terms of legislation, online retail becomes very established. We're getting to that stage now. So we'll start to see Vietnam moving up and become a more mature market. Then the, the quality of the, uh, of the product that we're currently seeing, again, I'll let Greg talk about the more, the, the, the specification of the, uh, of the product that we're currently seeing. So we'll start to see a little bit more sophisticated warehouses in the market, which will be able to cope for all this, if this uh, demand moving forward. The challenges, the three key challenges that we've, the, the feedback that we get from most businesses in Vietnam, infrastructure, still a long way to go in terms of infrastructure. I think Vietnam is one of the highest spending in terms of GDP, it's spending a lot of money on infrastructure, but still a considerable long way to go to make it much more efficient. And then we see the uh, process for trading, so that customs process is still very time consuming. You'll see within the report, the average number of days to get customs in and out of the country is still very challenging, and that obviously needs to be improved. And then overall, the ease of doing business, and I was talking to, who was I talking to? At uh, the Korean, uh, Korean chamber here. So the ease of doing business in Vietnam is still needs significant improvement. Um, but I'm hoping step by step we'll, we'll you know, move, move up that, uh, up the ranking. Where we are, as I mentioned, still fairly early days, still in the sort of very, you know, in the immature phase, but our belief is Vietnam is growing and it's really establishing itself and it will move into that next growth phase where we see uh, Thailand, China and Singapore. And then in terms of the last point, industry 4.0, this will have an impact on, in terms of the industrial market. What we're now seeing, we are seeing smart warehouses, smart factories. It's all about automation, it's about robotics, it's about the internet of things and how we actually do business in the future. This will play a very important role um, in Vietnam, we believe, and Greg's the, uh, this is your subject matter, your specialist subject, isn't it, Greg? So Greg's going to give you the full rundown on how Industry 4.0 is uh, going to have some impact in Vietnam. That's about it from me. So the key takeaways, just to sum it all up, export-driven economy, very much, um, uh, you know, we, we're seeing this big growth what is the, one of the reasons why GDP growth is so strong is because it's very much driven by the exports that are, that are happening. Big movement from China, very much it, you know, will take place and we expect that to continue. The strategic location, evolving logistics market, which I've touched on, and then the infrastructure 
and Industry 4.0. Thank you.